Hi, Kim. <clears throat> can you hear me? I can. Good. I was having computer troubles and I thought, oh no, not oh. today. No, no. So <laughs> got my other computer, which will be fine as long as I don't unplug it. So anyway, I okay. think we're, we're good. So you want to do a little testing of some of the yeah, so I will do, I have two kinds of videos. One is embedded, or like some are embedded and some are um, through a YouTube link. So okay. just okay. want to make sure both work. they both work. You bet. So. <clears throat> and, and I got some stats. It said 27 people watched the last, the recording of the last one. So that's oh, great. Because that's great. in addition to in the, addition to the what, 40 so some that were on. Yeah. That's fabulous. Yeah, I was really pleased. So yeah, wonderful. Um, let me see. I'm gonna share and then I think in this case I'm sharing my desktop, not my PowerPoint, because it will go online. So yeah. yeah. And if you show you show your desktop, you can then everything happens, right? Exactly. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will just. Okay, here's a little guy online who's the cutest ever. And that it is actually time for us to begin. So um, I think I'll end the poll. I think we can see from the poll that we have quite a few SLPs and uh, a couple of OTs, which is great because this is certainly something that is that as everything is, it's combined work, but um, it's really nice to have that. So I'm gonna get the poll out of the way and, uh, oh, share the results. So there it is. Can everyone see the results of the poll? 72% SLP, 11% OT, 6% AT specialist, and 11% other. Yeah, so 6% is one person. 6% <laughs> <Just laughs> is one person, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Which is fine, which is great. All right, um, so, and, and some people in the chat are gonna say who they are when they have groups of people together. So, um, thank you all for attending again today, and certainly thank you to Kim and Carrie for continuing um, part two of this uh, series for us. And I, for one, and I told, uh, I told Kim this as we were starting, that I actually um, have actually started using their framework in meetings because it really helps people to think this through. So, that, which is why I guess I was so excited to have you talk to us. <laughs> it's such a practical thing. So, um, welcome again. Uh, Kim is the SLP on the team. Carrie is the OT on the team. I'll let you guys talk a little bit more about yourselves. Um, I'm hoping that everyone has watched part one, but if you haven't, you can go back and do that. And I guess with that in mind, I'm going to mute. I'll follow the chat and um, hand it over to you, Kim. Great. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, back or welcome for the first time. We are um, really going to be launching off of our first session. So uh, we do a little recap, but if you're a, a little bit confused, just know what Kathy said. You can go back and um, watch session one and it should all make a little more sense. Um, I, I, I am an SLP, my partner Carrie's an OT, and we wrapped an assistive technology lab in Portland, Oregon as part of a nonprofit called Community Vision. So we've been working together for about 10 years, yeah. Um, and we have really been practicing this approach for many, many years, but just a few years ago we were um, able to actually operationalize it into this training, which is really helpful um, way. Sometimes, you know, you practice things that sort of seem like the right thing or feel right, but not until you operationalize it, then can you sort of make it more understandable for others. So at the end of today, we'll, we're going to wrap up with a tool that can help you if you're working with families or teams um, to explain the approach and kind of organize your tools. So, I 
<clears throat> so we're going to first do a quick review of the components um, and then really today is about exploring some specific tools or ideas um, both around participation and then access practice and then we'll talk about supporting uh, language development um, and just a little discussion about the benefits of light tech AAC and then we'll wrap up with um, that handout for organizing the tools. So our quick review of session one um, is that for communicative competence, we all, whether we use AAC or not, have to have a knowledge of the language, so the words, vocabulary, grammar, etc. But we also need um, to have the ability to use it in real life, and that's sort of those social skills. Um, but then for AAC, there are these extra external demands because it is an external to tool. And so there's the visual motor operation of the device. Um, and specifically, uh, this approach talks about um, separating some of the goals between that access, visual motor access to a device and learning and developing the language and social tools. Um, so just if you haven't seen it, the basics are uh, the PAL stands for P is for participation and that's sort of targeting that social um, development access a is the access the actual operation of the tools and then language is our knowledge of the words grammar and meaning and we separate all of these um, in the hopes that we will uh, not overwhelm a child or a student because there's a lot to learn at the beginning especially if you have some um, sensory and visual motor access challenges in addition to learning language um, uh, and so it's a journey and we are just separating out these ideas. And then our recap at the end of last session was just that um, engagement is really the key to begin the whole process. And that really is um, the way to build communication. Um, and that participation, the P part of the approach, you can start from day one when you meet somebody. You don't have to, you know, there's some really simple tools and we're gonna look at some of those today and you can, literally just start that right away. Um, and again, just separating those goals. So um, we are, are allocating our resources between access and language. Um, and that, that access practice really needs to be fun. So you have positive experiences with technology. Um, and then we want to start at least with modeling and supporting language development because we don't want to wait for the access piece to get figured out before we begin any um, sort of exploring language tools. So we're going to just launch into some tools and examples. Um, I know it's a little bit awkward on Zoom to unmute or pop into chat, but um, like I had said before, it's wonderful to be able to meet virtually. Um, but the, it can be a little intimidating to jump in, but I would like you to be as comfortable as you can if you have other experiences or ideas around any of these tools. We would love to hear about that. So for young children and really children of many ages, singing is a great way to participate. Children often love music and they love singing. It's a really big part of development. Um, and I hear somebody is um, not muted. It's a little background noise. Um, yeah. I don't know. If I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, so singing is a really great tool. There's a, a sing. There's a. Um, little communication tool called the step-by-step. -step. We talked about it during the last session a little bit. And it's just a little communicator where it's just digitized voice. So you just record. Uh, and there are single message buttons that look just like this. Those are called one steps. But we really love the step-by-step -step because you can do a single message, but you also have the ability to do uh, a whole series of messages. And I'm just gonna share this awesome video of this little boy that we don't know. I literally just found this online and fell in love with it. His name is Lachlan and he's a wee wee one. Um, I'm guessing maybe 15 to 18 months and he is using his step-by-step. -step. 
watch the whole thing, but uh, we'll just get back into it. So really awesome timing, um, a fun way for him to participate. And you see a really simple tool um, where obviously it's not a really robust language system, but he already is, he's learned so much about those social skills, about just timing and that back and forth reciprocity with his partner. Um, so really can be a very powerful tool, the step-by-step. Uh, here's another little girl that we work with. We were uh, um, doing an AAC clinic at a camp. And again, where you're going to see an example of another use of step-by-step. -step. The kids were all making bottle rockets and they were doing, you know, various countdowns. So really quickly, one of the SLP grad students was able to program a simple countdown. So she got to lead the group in the countdown. And one of the things we love about this is just how quick it is. Um, same camp, different girl, um, who this little girl loved to tell jokes. Uh, so at the lunch table, uh, we programmed some jokes and uh, you will see, I'll, ex I'll explain our little series of jokes in just a second and I might have to, it's hard to hear, so. Um, and then I just wanted to say, uh, I. I did not record this. I only recorded this with her with me. So she knew exactly what was on this button. Um, obviously, if you're programming a button like this, whoever is using it needs to know what the purpose of it is and what's on it. Um, so uh, I asked her if she wanted to do a joke, and we figured out which one we wanted to do, and, and then I programmed it with her right there. So here we go. Who's got a joke? You want to do it? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Who's there? Dwayne. Dwayne. Dwayne who? Dwayne the Batman and Melanie. Joey! <laughs> 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 Anyways, uh, I think that was more of an adult joke than a kid joke, and you'll see an example of what a kid joke looks like in the next slide. Um, but you saw this little girl has Rett syndrome, and you can see from an access standpoint, you know, she, her timing, if we, if I had just put the step-by-step -step there and let her have at it, she probably would have activated a little too um, quickly and didn't, wouldn't, so I gave her timing support, and that's partially because of her hand use with Rett syndrome. And so at the beginning, especially, if, if we're still working on access, even with a simple tool like this, um, we want it to be successful because the point is the social interaction more than really getting the timing exactly right. Um, and so because of her hand motion, the multiple taps, I just moved the step-by-step -step in and out to help with that timing. Um, and then, so what happened after this is a bunch of the kids were like, hey, what is that thing? And so we ran around and we taught the kids how to program the step-by-step. -step. And then um, a lot of them also wanted to tell jokes with it, which is awesome. We love that. Um, and so here is a little girl who was working or who was at the table. And so she recorded this joke. So hard to hear when it just says, so talk about timing, right? She didn't even wait for an answer. Her, her uh, program was just knock, knock, who's there, underpants. 
Um, so we realized, of course, that our whole Dwayne the bathtub I'm drowning was just like way too adult. Um, but uh, they had fun just kind of going around the table and everyone programming those jokes. So just a really fun um, experience with the technology, getting a lot of that social interaction. And then uh, we're big proponents of sharing the technology with all of the kids in the room um, to normalize that technology. So it's not just the, the one child who you know, uses this strange, unknowable uh, tool, but they all get used to it. And the benefits of that are um, the child not really feeling like they're sticking out um, like a sore thumb, but also um, the other children, when they have experience programming and using devices to communicate or tell jokes or whatever, um, when the child who has complex communication needs uses those tools, they're going to naturally be more comfortable with how to um, respond because they will have used the tool as well. So it really has multiple benefits um, we have found. Uh, here's another example of a little girl um, who, um, she, this is quite a few years ago, she was just coming into our clinic and her mom was really great about figuring out what kind of news she wanted to share. So she came in, she also has Rett syndrome. You'll see a little um, hand support there. Here we go. You look so excited. I have new friends coming to visit me from California. saying something no, um, good. thank you <laughs> she's adorable and i love the way you have the um step-by-step -step mounted there too that's really a good thing yeah say. yeah so there's some kids who really like that they would um maybe go to school and they could have it mounted and they just just to walk down the hall and be like hey hi how are you how's it going yep. just you know a really nice way for them to participate in just walking down the hall um and like I said, it can help with timing, but we don't get too particular about it being like, no, 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 it has to be exactly the right timing. We do whatever support. Um, she's figuring out her access. Um, you'll see that she had a little bit of um, some double hand motion um, with Rett syndrome. She, did, she does have a splint, but she wasn't wearing it at the time. So I just held her hand naturally. And then um, it was a little easier for her to activate when she just had one hand kind of naturally restrained and the other, it freed the other one up to use the button a little um, more easily. Uh, and then also if she wants to go through it a couple of times, we're like, yeah, we'll talk about it again. So we, first time she's told me, the next time she told Carrie. Um, and so really, we don't want to get too stuck on timing immediately. We really want it to be about um, that easy access. I'm trying to figure it out. And really it's through using it that kids are going to um, have those experiences and learn the timing. <clears throat> okay, so that was sort of like, so the step-by-step -step honestly can be used. I, I feel like we could, if we could have a step-by-step -step almost for every child with complex communication needs, that would be a, a potentially great tool. It really is limited only by our own imaginations and it's really quick to, uh, to program. I will say on a, a side note, a sadness we have is there used to be an app called Tap Speak Sequence. Some of you might have used it, but it was very much like a step-by-step, -step, but it was on an iPad. And the benefit of it was because with the step-by-step, -step, you, you know, let's say I did the countdown and then the next time I wanted to do the um, jokes, you re-record over yourself. Um, the Tap Speak Sequence let you store 
you know, you could have 20 jokes stored, you could have stories. Um, and unfortunately, it hasn't been supported. I think the developer went out of business and it hasn't been supported for quite a few years. So it's um, not functional anymore. So that's, I, I want to find a developer to make another one. But uh, if anyone hears of anything, let me know. So I'm going to just launch into this, some other ideas unless anyone has anything they want to say good okay yeah I'm just gonna say again I mean these things these tools have been around for a long time and it's great to see them uh, what I really again what I really again value is how you're um, using them without mm -hmm. thinking about you're using them for participation and being really honest I guess about the, I don't know if honest is the right word but being really intentional about that so I think that's really important too yeah yeah and I think on it so I think a lot of you will see some tools where you're like yeah I, I know that I know that um, tool it's a mind shift of j thinking about the day like how what could we and it doesn't have to be all day every day but it's those little insertions throughout the day like hey here's a time when you know ellie could you know ask the class questions or it's just sort of thinking about those opportunities uh scattered throughout a day or a week for a child um so in a classroom setting of course being able to uh do presentations or show and tell etc any sort of I'm talking in front of the class, there's quite a few tools that you could use for this. Um, one is Pictello, which you may have heard of. It's um, by Assistiveware, the folks who do ProLoco to Go. Um, and it's basically a talking photo album, it has really high quality voices. Um, you can do text to speech with um, the a cappella voices. You can also record if there is a child who wanted to record. For another child um, even children who um, some students who maybe have speech but when it comes to presenting in front of a whole class where they might be harder to understand or they get anxious um, if they're able to record their own voices or do text-to-speech um, outside of the um, and then do this as their presentation it can really it can even help with that um, you can also embed videos in Pictello, so it's, it's a really nice way to do presentations. Um, last week we showed you Weston's Telegami, um, that's where he did the hammerhead shark, uh, pre uh, presentation of hammerhead sharks, and it's an avatar. Um, so as we told you last week, Telegami is no longer supported. It's also a, a developer, I think, that stopped you know, updating their app. And so you can't download it anymore. And I have been looking for a while for a replacement and haven't found one, but I just found one recently, this Voki, V-O-K-I. Uh, and there is a free version and there's also a paid version. It's actually, from what I could tell, it's actually designed for classrooms, it, and then the, if you do a paid version in a classroom, there's just a lot more functionality in terms of the choice of avatar and the background and et cetera. So, but it's, um, you can at least start free. And so here's an example of uh, doing a presentation on the solar system. Hello, I am presenting on our solar system. Our solar system is called the Milky Way or planet Earth is the third planet of so anyways we won't go through but so you can it was just a text to speech this was the free version i just did a little um video capture of my voki but that's an idea for presentations and again i'm going to talk about normalizing the technology when we've gone into some classrooms and we introduce an avatar to do a presentation do you want to guess how many kids would be interested in doing an avatar presentation? It's pretty close to 100%. So some teachers uh, have allowed any student who maybe, maybe not all the time, but maybe they at least get to do one avatar presentation, you know, in a, a year or semester, whatever they decide. And the kids love it. It's really fun. And again, it normalizes the technology. And so when the child who needs to use this technology uses it it really makes the other, helps the other you know the children have had experience with it and then they can respond to it more naturally than if they don't know anything about the tool 
that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight some kids, all these pieces have come together. They have their speech generating device. Um, they're doing great with their language and their access, but we can also remember that we want to do programming with participation in mind um, on uh, SGDs as well. So this little girl, Leanna, is going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I apologize, it's a very American thing, but um, <laughs> uh, so here she is doing her, with her eye gaze device, her pledge. My name is Leanna. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So that's it. Again, really simple, but just remembering that uh, when children have speech generating devices, sometimes we want to think about, you know, continuing that participation, those um, opportunities through their speech generating device as well. Okay. And then I just want to have a word about sequential scripts. Maybe many of you have done these already. So, um, you know, if you're telling news or a story, Etc. Um, there's just a few things that help sequential scripts be a little more um, successful. And so uh, you want to think of your programming to sort of reduce some of those. Um, if a person responds and then it's not programmed, so it kind of derails the direction of the, the script, there's things you can do to kind of lead, like guess what I did this weekend? You know, it's going to be pretty predictable that somebody's going to say, what? And then you say, well, I went to a birthday party and you'll never guess what happened. So you can do those leading things to help guide the, uh, the unknowing partner <laughs> into what the, you know, the most predictable response would be in the script. Um, and then of course it is really only good and pretty predictable interchanges or routines. Um, and then when we're programming, you just kind of try to think about the natural flow of a conversation. And then we usually try to end it with some kind of a statement or question that is sort of a marker like, we're over now. And then we'll often program a blank hit in there just in case you do get a kiddo who hits it again by accident. Um, it gives you a little clue like, oh, it's a blank one, we know we're at the end, um, just to help it be more um, successful. And really, we found this mostly to be great with, you know, looking, you know, helping give experience in that reciprocity and uh, natural timing and just those social skills. So Carrie is going to talk about um, access practice tools, unless anyone wants to chime in about uh, participation so far. I'll just say, and I've got my grandson on my knee, yeah. and that you know one of the things that I found really helpful when I used this out uh, in the world was to actually go through the child's day and, as you just said, figure out what are the times that it it can purely be a participation activity, right? And so it really helps teens to think through some of these things. So. As you said, right? It, I mean, take it and make it real practical for teams to think this through. So yeah, and just keeping in mind, it doesn't have to be a masterpiece. It can be the tiniest little, like the step by step to say Happy Halloween, trick or treat when when a child is out. It can be super super simple, and sometimes that's the that's when you can end up doing more things for a child when you don't have to. Um, you know, worry about it being really complex or long. Okay, so here's Carrie. Hello. So. Hello, Carrie. <laughs> you or hear you? I'll be back. Um, so as Kim mentioned, for that access practice piece, um, we really want to start with play-based and fun activities, and thinking about what is that cognitive load. Um, thinking of all the visual skills that might be needed, the motor skills, the auditory skills, sensory regulation, um, pulling that 
cognitive piece out, pulling that language piece out, and really get it, giving the child a chance to practice this motor piece, this body piece, in a fun, um, maybe even errorless activity um, where they're not having to think about all the language and other components. Um, and it can take time for practice accuracy to be good enough that um, there's not that frustration. So again, starting in the beginning with really those fun activities. So we're gonna see some examples in a moment and examples of tools. Um, but first I wanted to introduce you to a little guy, Kenny, and his journey um, with switch access. And so he um, was 18 months old in this video here. This is at a teaching hospital and his team called us in to find out what could be the next step for him. They had um, gotten him an adaptive switch toy with one switch that he was able to activate with his hand and make the toy go. And they just didn't know where to go from there. Also with the mindset of what can we do now to set him up for um, access to augmentative communication. He has cerebral palsy and cortical vision impairment. And so they knew that switch access was likely gonna be his method for communication. Um, and they did note for us before we came in that when he hit his um, switch with his hand, that his head was, would often drop. And so they just didn't know where to go next. So in this little video, we'll kind of show you within an hour, which was a long time for him, and he hung in there. Um, we just had this one opportunity to come into the teaching hospital. Mom was totally on board and really excited to see um, what Kenny could do. So you'll see in the beginning that we start with a head switch that we fold up for little Kenny. And um, we found out from mom what is super motivating for him, and he loved to hear her sing. And she actually had some songs recorded on her phone, but we didn't bring an adapter with us. So we had to fudge it a little bit where, you know, when he activates his switch, we, we touch the phone and then the music plays. But it's kind of that early cause effect with mom singing, um, and we're holding that little head switch. So you'll see him progress from a one switch to a, some two switch activities in a fairly short period of time. So we're gonna watch this video on Kenny. to figure out which switch activated which device and he had never done a head switch or any other switch activity besides this one toy um, before that day and within that short period of time he's starting to figure out which switch activates which device how do I move my head but you can see in the beginning that we set him up to have a really positive interchange and experience with this technology so we decided to just have him sit on the bench. We brought the switches to his head so that we were right there kind of at the ready. 
Um, we could have had him in like a stroller and mounted a bunch of things. Um, but because of his tone, you know, the switch could like hit him in the wrong place and he could have ended up frustrated. So in that very early um, kind of assessment period where you're just exposing a child to technology, we, we really like to be a smart partner and be there at the ready. Um, so it's a, a successful experience for him. Um, you also could see that we didn't use kind of the phrase like hit the switch, get the switch, because um, it's really not about the switch. The switch is just a means to an end. So we might use phrases like, oh, more music. What happens next? Um, to keep his focus on the activity. And just through practice, he started to learn where that switch was and what he needed to do to activate it. Um, so in the next slide, I'm gonna show you kind of where Kenny is today and how this laid the foundation for his communication system um, and where he is now. So here, um, we've got a lot of tools up here, but I just wanted you to see um, kind of this multimodal communication approach that we had for Kenny. So over on the left, you see the step-by-step, -step, which he's got one now. He's using it at home. He's using it in his preschool um, just to participate in circle time, sing songs. Um, and then underneath, you can see some switch toys. He's actually starting some powered mobility um, trials. So he's about three years old now. So again, practicing that head switch access, even in a powered wheelchair, is kind of the ultimate play uh, access practice, um, where you can just kind of wander around in a large space um, on a slow setting and just really get that practice of going between the two head switches. And at the top, you'll see um, he's got some apps on an iPad. Um, th these are the Big Bang series, so it's high contrast. Because he has that cortical vision, it's still good for him to practice um, his visual skills, and he has a vision specialist. So those are kind of his um, access tools, the step-by-step -step assist participation tool. And then over the, to the right, you can see he now has um, a communication, a light tech communication book, and it's got high contrast symbols for him. Um, and then the way he's accessing this book right now is with a yes and no switch. And so it's um, that early auditory scanning through a list. And so here his physical therapist is going through the book. He's got some play choices and she holds the yes switch on one side and the no switch on the other. And he's able to scan through a list of activities like you know, what should we do today? Should we play on the swing, go on the bike, go outside, do something else? And so he's able to scan through an auditory list. Um, that's kind of set the foundation for that uh, communication piece. And so now um, he, the last we heard, he is doing some device trials now. Carrie, um, so that, yeah. There was a question in the chat um, huh? whether that was in the same session. I'm thinking uh, not. No. <laughs> this was actually about a year later. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great question. We, we don't have a magic wand or magic carpet or anything like that <laughs> yeah so over um after we had that session with the, the teaching or the, at the teaching hospital we were able to give his um school early intervention team some ideas and his private therapist ideas and mom some ideas so that they kind of worked on those and it led up to this about a year or so later so thanks for the clarification there <laughs> and if there's any other questions feel free to chime in so here we're just going to run from, through some tool ideas, tools for working on that access piece, some play ideas and fun ideas. So for switch activities, you guys might have lots of ideas. There's a million out there. Um, some of the favorites we have are um, at the top on the left is a young lady with a power link. That's um, where you can have anything that plugs in. So here she's got a blender. You could have a fan, a lamp. Um, and so she's able to help blend her smoothie um, with a switch. And down below um, and underneath in the middle is a spinner. And that's made by AbleNet. There's um, different spinners out there. And so you could put your own cards on the spinner. It could be part of a game. It could be, um, you know, maybe the students in the classroom and, you know, you're, the student could um, call out who, you know, the order of everyone to line up. So the possibilities are endless with spinners, um, but just a really fun way to um, some participation and then also working on if someone needs to work on that switch access piece. And then um, I don't know if anyone has the switch adapted uh, paint spinner, but that is a, a hit around here um, for all kids and not just kids that, you know, utilize the switches. But as Kim says, said really normalizing that technology and letting everyone to participate 
using these tools. So there are some switch ideas. Um, and then on the iPad, there's tons of apps out there, but thinking about the layout of your apps and how someone could be working on their targeting practice with their finger. Um, again, not necessarily with a language system, keeping that piece separate in the beginning if someone's really needing to practice on that targeting, the targeting piece with their finger, or any of these apps can be switch adapted. So maybe they're using, um, you know, two switch step scanning to go through their choices, but thinking about you know, what are some fun motivating things you could program and then what the layout might be on whatever um, app that you're choosing. So these are just some free examples up here, some fun activities, um, making animal sounds, funny songs, or funny sounds, songs. Um, again, just keeping it really light um, and fun. And any of these can also um, have a key guard overlay on it. So a plastic key guard could be made to fit any of these if that helps somebody with their targeting as well. And last month we mentioned Cantunes. That's a favorite around here made by University of Victoria. It's a free app that pulls music from your iTunes account and there's different layouts. So I think it could have, I think it's, you could have two albums up, four, six, 12. Um, so different layouts. And again, just that Airless fun, you know, if someone likes music, um, just really so they can, can work on their um, targeting practice. And this can also be switch adapted. And key guards, so I mentioned key guards. There's endless amounts of ways to make key guards. So they can be custom ordered online. Um, or if you have access to a 3D printer, um, some people are starting to make their own, laser cut their own. Um, so there's a lot of options either for a speech generating device or an iPad to have that key guard or even a, a keyboard. So there are key guards that can go over a keyboard for typing that can help somebody get their finger in the right spot. So just to recap on some of those tools, both for participation and access, we talked about Pictello. That's a great app. I think it's uh, eight, $18, 20, 20 bucks now. Um, there's some free options uh, that are similar, talking photo albums, but we really do like Pictello and how it works. It's um, really slick and um, that also can be switch adapted. Um, there's a free version of GoTalk Now, Sounding Board's free. We talked about Cantoons, Vokey's free. Of course, the step-by-step -step is such a great tool. Um, and then Animals is another free app that kind of has that grid layout and you can space it out however you'd like. So before we launch into um, the language part of PAL, or if there's any questions about anything at all, happy to answer. I have a question. Sure. I was just curious, so whenever you're, using like the go talk now app do you have a switch interface that you recommend that's easy to set up and train parents on yeah that's a great question so there's a couple different interfaces that will work um, on the ipad for any app so the ablenet hook we use a lot and then ablenet also makes the bluetooth and I, is there any other ones praetorian inclusive technology so those are the three that we know of have you used an interface before um, I have, and when I tried the hook, I had, I did iOS settings and I made it switch accessible, but then it messed up like within the GoTalk app. I also, I, I forgot to turn on the switches. So it was kind of, it was a training piece and I kind of failed as far as like training the parent oh. on how to set yeah. up. <laughs> and, and we know, we know how that goes with technology. Yeah, so the right now they have the applicator, so I'm exploring that, and it seems to be easy connectivity, yeah, but it's difficult, like just figuring out which mode to set it on. And yes, and, and the Praetorian is the um, that's the applicator. That's the applicator is the Praetorian. Yeah, so we'll see if Kim has a, a, a tip because I, I know what you're talking about on this. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, so there's a, a funny thing that happened um, on iPad a couple, I think it was when we went to 11. Um, it used to be all switch interfaces had uh, keyboard commands. Um, so, you know, space and enter or one and two, et cetera. And so when people first started doing um, iPad interfaces, it was very app specific. So go talk now because they were, you know, an AT uh, focused 
developer, they made switch accessibility within their app that would have been that kind of like space and enter based technology. But then when the iPad itself became switch accessible through the actual iOS, it did not use keyboard commands. It uses iPad specific commands. So something like tap the screen or you can tell it to swipe or you can tell it to um, move to the next item or make a selection. And so it was very specific commands. And so it, you can actually get a little messed up by um, going into the iOS and making it switch accessible and then going into the program itself and turning on the switch accessibility, they end up fighting each other. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that is what happened or if that kind of makes sense of maybe why things didn't work out very well. Yes. Yeah. That ended up, that's exactly what happened. So right. I'm still, I'm in this, you know, operational trying to figure out the operational use of hooking up the switch interfaces and probably not part of this training, but definitely looking for help in some of those operational things when it comes to setting up switch interfaces with switches, de depending on if it's a switch accessible app versus not. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And if you ever want to just like email or call us, we'd be happy to like just talk through some of that stuff too. I, it does seem like we should have some sort of a, I don't know if hands-on is very good via Zoom, but it's like multiple people I think would like to dig into some of the iPad setup things because once you got once you've got it going, it works really nicely. But there's a lot of like you can put one little setting wrong and um, things won't will not work very well. So yeah, this sounds yeah. like a future session, guys. I'm really lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, great. And then I was going to also say um, about the key guards, Carrie and I, sometimes you don't have, like, you don't have the special key guard that you, you need. And we've literally taken some foam core and made, you know, took a screenshot and then cut out our pattern. And then just, uh, how did we attach that? I think it was just with straps, some kind of elastic band yeah. thing. Um, so you can do some makeshift stuff too, if you think a key guard is going to be helpful for that targeting practice yeah for yeah for trials yeah not permanently okay so i will just talk a little bit about language development unless there's anything else we don't want to rush you guys so anything else about the access piece nope okay so language development and just supporting um i am probably preaching to the choir here about um modeling um but uh modeling is sometimes called aided language stimulation so for those of you who haven't heard of that term before aided language is um any sort of an aac tool that uses external whether it's a symbol or a device external tools and so it's really language stimulation but using aided language um, and then just pointing out that aac is obviously an expressive tool but for some children it can help um, with their receptive language too, just having that visual support. So even if they're not ready to use the system, us using the system to talk to them can be really helpful. Um, and then um, light tech has easier access, and we'll dig into that a little bit um, in a second. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about smart partners. So, um, here's just a little graphic about modeling, um, just to remind ourselves that really whatever um, we're hoping for the output of a child in terms of communication, they really need that for input, right? So we speak to our babies and our children with the idea that they will acquire language and speak. But if that, for some reason, is not going to happen, and then we think we want AAC, if we just give them spoken language, Right, it's confusing for them to then figure out an AAC system all on their own. So we really want that input to be AAC so that they know how to use the AAC. Um, and then sometimes we think about how much modeling because sometimes it feels like we, we model a lot and we still don't see any results from an expressive standpoint and we get maybe we wonder if, we, if we're on the right track. Um, but 
I like to think not just about um, the amount of time, like sometimes we'll be like a year, but if you really think about how much speech uh, a baby hears um, before they're competent communicators, so like not just the time, but like mom talks, dad talks, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, neighbor, um, Amazon delivery person, person at the grocery store, the TV, there's speech all around us. And um, so learning AAC, right, in a non-AAC world can take quite a bit of time. There's lots of speech around us and very little AAC. And I like, um, I found this graphic that I really like, I've heard this, um, I don't know, I, who is, oh yeah, Jane Corston, um, who came up with the statistics that by 18 months, babies have heard on average 4,380 hours of spoken language um, and we still don't expect them to be fluent speakers and if we use that amount um, for our AAC learners who are seeing their AAC systems used let's say twice weekly for 20 to 30 minutes it would take 84 years for them to have the same uh, amount of um, input so we just have to remember that obviously we, we you know even if they don't get the same amount, remembering that it, it's important to do it as much as we can. You've, some of you have probably heard this statistic before. It's rather shocking. <laughs> um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about what a smart partner is um, and just remembering that we are smarter than technology. We don't always feel that way, um, but uh, if you slide your finger across a screen on an iPad to land somewhere, that iPad or that device is not gonna know that you didn't intend that first touch and you were really um, going for that final touch. Um, so we, but we can see that. So we are smarter than technology um, and that um, smart partners can support access as I was talking, but also can support memory and staying on task. And for those early attempts, we can make meaning from those attempts. We can go with the flow and try to form meaning. And we'll look at a couple of examples in a second. And of course, we're really engaging too. We're fun. So here's an example of um, Linda Burkhart uh, talking with a little girl with Rett syndrome. And you will see that she is giving access support. She's scanning and turning the pages, but uh, also, and she's engaging, and also she is making a little bit of meaning, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Yes, okay, more to say. <laughs> Something's wrong thinking question? One of those? Yes. Okay. Something's wrong? Yes! Something's wrong! Oh no! Something's wrong! Something's wrong! Tired, hurt, uncomfortable, one of those? Tired, hurt, uncomfortable? Yes! Oh my goodness! Tired? Tired? Oh, you think you're tired, huh? Well, I'll tell you what I think. Go back. Go back. More to say. I think. I think. You are silly. I think you're silly. You just took a nap. You just took a nap. I think you're silly. You're telling me you're tired. I think you're silly. So you can see uh, the little girl did end up saying yes to the first item on the list and maybe she intended that and maybe she didn't we don't know if she's just in the exploration mode but linda kept it engaging and that's where she was forming the meaning and that she just kept going with it took it and then made her own comments about how silly it was that she would be tired so uh our smart partners can really take those early attempts and make them meaningful and engaging which really builds on the sort of language um, experience of a child as they're learning those early skills <clears throat> and of course we're there for access support smart partners here's a uh, a young man who has a book and he knows his book it's 
it's, it's, it's newish, but he knows it fairly well. And we were working on um, developing a yes, no here. And so you'll see um, some head switches. Our school choices are swing, rocking chair, read a book, sing a song, iPad, play, watch a video or something else. Swing. Rocking chair? No. Read a book. Yes. That's a great no. idea. So we'll figure out. So yeah, he was just working on that head development. So I'm there for access support. You can see I can read his body movements and then I would just activate. Uh, the point wasn't for him to actually hit those switches, but just to develop that head movement in a, um, a response to scanning through a list. Um, here is a young boy using his pod book and he's a direct selector. And I just want you to look um, at the sort of fineness of how his finger goes. And then you'll see at the end when they're on the TV page, he actually rests his hand on the paper. So um, even for direct selectors, uh, access um, can be a work in progress, but he's still got lots to say. More to say. And mom is filming and being partner, so it's a little wonky, the video. More to say. I want, I want, right here, watch TV, yeah, I want, you'll see his hand rests, the and channel. then he touches, yeah, change the channel, yeah, okay, so we change the channel, and I like that one too, because clearly there's something really boring on TV. And so here he has access to a lot of language. It's not just a request, it's getting down to some fine detail about actually wanting to change the channel. Um, and you can see a little bit of the finger movement and then his hand rested on the page as he touched, um, changed the channel. And so just that light tech, option if that had been on a dynamic screen there probably would have been lots of errors in that um, navigation so the partner smart partner is there both to um, turn the pages but also to to see what his uh, targets were um, so there's not just pod books um, there's lots of variations of light tech books um, this is a Spanish English core board with some fringe vocabulary that we developed here at the lab. Um, and then there's lots of light tech alternative access. All of these are pod examples. And the reason is because there's actually templates for these, um, but you could make uh, any light tech system alternative access, whether um, it's an eye gaze um, board or high contrast and um, an auditory scanning book or the one in the bottom left corner is actually maybe somebody who could do just like an eye gaze or a gross hit to a quadrant and then you could just scan um, the the four cells in the quadrant so a little bit of a access uh, shortcut. I'm going to put in a little bit of a um, comment here though because yeah. I would never be able to create a light tech system yeah. that comes anywhere close to the thinking that Gil Porter did with the know. Book, right so um and and at the end today i'm gonna if if those of you who aren't or are still around we and, and don't know we are going to do a two-day pod in edmonton in march so um this is kind of a nice segue to thinking about why and I'm not even. I, I'm trying not to call it light tech and hard tech. I'm trying a non-electronic system might be a really valid approach. So I love that you guys are doing this. And um, and yeah, and and again, just a shout out, I guess, to Gail Porter. That yes. one, I couldn't. The the thought that's gone into that those pod systems is um, amazing. So it's very phenomenal. And I just I only say that as a caveat so people don't think I'm just you know, trying to sell pod, but she has put a ton of thought into it. And when you hear her um, 
present, you realize like there's even more thought than you could possibly imagine. Um, and you're right, to get a robust system and to create it from scratch um, in an alternative access kind of way is, is, would be incredibly time consuming. So, um, and so I just wanna say that uh, around to continue what you're saying, um, Kathy, is those light tech supports, um, A, are really important in a multimodal system. Um, if you're outside and it's sunny or it's too cold or it's raining or it's just too glary and you can't see your screen, you need to have another option. Um, also, we know that technology always fails or the battery runs out just when you need it. Um, so it's also good for a backup system. But really, um, when we are talking about separating out some of these skills, it can really be more efficient for um, early language learners and anybody who has difficult access. Even once they're really, um, you know, they're a little more dialed in with their electronic system, having a light tech um, backup system or for some things where they just, they need their partner to help them because they're tired or whatever. Um, it's really important to, um, we, I think sometimes poo poo, we say light tech instead of low tech just because low sounds like it's, you know, lower rung on the ladder. Um, but yeah, non-electronic or light tech, it's just, it's a really good option and remembering that, um, it's not always about what's easier for us, but sometimes it's easier for the child to not underestimate the power of a system like this too. Okay, so I know we're almost out of time. I don't wanna, um, there's a handout that um, you would have gotten called Communication Tools and Strategies. And um, what it does is just a little chart that uh, separates out participation, access, and language because um, as we are, going along this journey, you may have different tools that you use at different times and it can get really confusing. And so to be able to kind of put them in a column like, oh, we're doing, you know, step by step for, you know, this kind of stuff and here's some of the access things we're doing and this is what we're doing for language. It just helps organize, but it also helps families and um, teams understand why, like, why don't you just get this child a Dynavox or whatever, they understand what the the processes and so I think um, we have found this tool to be really uh, helpful so I'm just gonna we're gonna show you an example of one and I'm gonna do a quick intro of Ellie she's using her step-by-step -step here the water spout. and she's just singing she's figuring out her access this is really early um, and she was having some issues like staying in her chair, chair so we got her out on the swing and she's just singing. She loves music too. Down came the rain. And she's um, pretty significant seizures, uh, cerebral palsy, cortical vision impairment, and some hearing impairment as well. Um, so she was doing her step by step for her participation. She had some fun, uh, those big bang patterns that Carrie was talking about on the iPad with switch access. We, meanwhile, we were, yeah, we were looking on. Um, her vision and refining her yes, no, figuring out her seating and what kind of mounting. Um, she, we started with a, um, a very early pod auditory scan that was modeling first. Um, and so this is what her handout looked like for preschools a couple of years ago, right? So we just have that step-by-step -step for singing, simple stories and preschool activities, um, and then some simple auditory scan for just directing activities. And then her access tools, her apps, she had one switch and she had some two switch activities and then some two switch play things that she liked, um, adaptive toys and a massager and fan. Plus she had some Mylar objects and shapes that she was working on with vision therapy. And um, for language, she had her um, pod book and uh, that was mostly being modeled and then some auditory scanning. And then we also, because we were not exactly sure what was going on with her hearing, um, we did do some touch cues as well uh, that we were experimenting with. Um, and then we were experimenting with some Mylar um, symbols as well. So th this is just kind of organizing the tools and then everyone can kind of see, oh, this is why we're doing, 
you know, this app with this switch. And this is why we're using the step-by-step -step and, oh, um, we have found it really just a helpful way to get everyone on the same page and understand why we're doing certain things. And today she has a Go Talk Now um, programmed with sort of the beginnings of the pod um, with high contrast that she is using to scan sometimes, but when she has difficulty, uh, her caregivers are at least using it to model with her as well. So sorry to kind of rush at the end there, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I don't know if there's any questions. Yeah, that's great. I know it's, it's just too, so much to talk about in so little time. It's almost <laughs> always is the case. Um, I, I'm going to just say, oh, I have, yeah, I should. This is my grandson. Oh, hi, buddy. <laughs> hi. You want to say hi, Logan? You're going to say hi. Hi, hi Logan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll stop with this for a little minute. Um, anyway, what I was going to say is, I, you know, your form is a really great place to start. And then I would encourage people to go through and, and take those pieces that you have in your form and say, and so when are we going to be intentional about doing this, right? And what do we need to do? I, yeah, I, I just think it is, it, 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 I'm going to say in some ways it's just total common sense, but on the other hand, it's like all common sense that's not really common. We have to think about doing it that way. So anyway, and, and taking it apart to put it back together, as you guys say. All right. So um, some other folks are saying um, people have to go. So um, anyway, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. And um, there's your contact information. Um, I'm assuming that you're, we, we probably won't be able to drop it in. Oh. No, I realized. But feel free to email if you have just any follow-up questions or need to, to do any sort of follow-up. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I appreciate it. And I know everyone else did too. And again, if people, you can email them or if you have questions or comments, you can email me and I know where to find them. So thank you again for these two both very um, practical sessions. It was lovely to have this very practical uh, conversation. And again, it sounds like there'll be some more practical sessions that will follow up upon this one. So thank you both. Um, you. Guys, go out and enjoy. I don't know, it's sunshiny here. I hope it's sunshiny where you all are. And um, we will talk soon and say bye, Logan. Bye-bye. Bye. bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>